Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a stack of Dvorak tone poems, the best ones and some of the not-so-best ones. Dvorak's tone poems are horribly underrated. They're underrated still. They really only became known in the West in, in well, in the 70s and 80s, Starting with Istvan Kertes's performances, he didn't record them all, so I can't really talk about his set because this talk is going to be about complete sets of the four really gruesome, creepy tone poems based on Czech folk music. There is a last tone poem, really Dvorak's last orchestral work, called Heroic Song, or Heldenlied, which was premiered by Mahler in the Vienna Philharmonic, which isn't too bad. Um, but that's a typical sort of Listian triumph over adversity piece of no specific Czech character. These, on the other hand, are two folk poems by a guy named Urban, and Dvorak stuck so closely to the plots of these poems that supposedly the melodies fit the words, although we don't know what they are. If we have, you can look them up if you're interested, but we're not going to worry about that because these pieces all follow musical rules and have musical forms, and they are wonderful, wonderful pieces. But there were two things, I think, that really kept them out of circulation. The first, and I think the most serious, is the fact that Dvorak was supposed to be a symphonist in the Brahmsian mold. And so nobody wanted to talk about music he did that was not in the Brahmsian mold. But these came after all of his symphonies when he started turning his attention to opera and symphonic poem. And of course, nobody wanted to admit either that a mere Czech guy, a little guy from a little country, could possibly be better than like Brahms at the orchestral bit, or maybe even Wagner at the operatic bit. I'm not saying he was a better composer than those two, but rather that he did all of those things equally well. And he did. He really did. Dvorak was, from a point of view of range and versatility, easily the greatest composer in the second half of the 19th century. I mean, he just was, if that's your definition of greatness, if you talk about writing masterpieces in every medium in which he worked. And for example, Tchaikovsky was a great, great, great composer, of course, and wrote masterpieces and all kinds of things. But, but his chamber music was never really anything special. It was always kind of controversial, whereas Dvorak was a master at chamber music. And Dvorak was a master operatic composer. Brahms never wrote operas. Sasson wrote magnificent instrumental music, but he was a failure as an operatic composer, except for Samson and Delilah. He was a one-shot wonder. You know, Dvorak did everything, and he did it all superbly well, including these last four symphonic poems, which are just amazing, amazing pieces, and which open up new vistas in Dvorak's technique. They are extravagantly scored. They are marvelously, marvelously designed to take advantage of new sonorities, instruments such as, you know, the harp and suspended cymbals and tam-tams and all that stuff that Dvorak would never have used in a symphony, but which he, but which he felt would be just dandy in operas and symphonic poems. But the other problem with the four gruesome symphonic poems is that they're gruesome. And they're gruesome in a particular way. They are Czech folk tunes, most of them about death and dismemberment in one way or another. And we'll get into that. But also because they have a sense of humor about it. You know, folk, folk tales in general have this curious mixture of comedy and solemnity, of, of the serious and the grotesque. And Dvorak captured that really, really beautifully in his music, but that's quite disconcerting for some people. When you find out what happens in these people, in these, in these tone poems, pardon me, when you find out what happens in them, the, the means by which Dvorak gets to the tragic conclusion can raise a few eyebrows. I just think it's, it's a function of his versatility, of his extremely wide range of expression, which everybody downplays and everybody denigrates and attempts to minimize, and they are four masterpieces. So, 
Without further ado, let's talk about what they are, and then we'll talk about the recordings. So there are four. There is the Water Goblin, there is the Noonday Witch, there is the Golden Spinning Wheel, and there is the Wood Dove. Some of these titles in English are a little different. Sometimes the Noonday Witch is the Noon Witch, the Wood Dove is the Wild Dove, but basically that's what they are. Let's start with the Water Goblin. Oh, I love the Water Goblin. Here is the, first of all, wait a minute, ah, wait a minute. Before we do the story, before I kill myself, we'll have another gruesome ending here. It's coming. No, seriously, though, the, eh, seriously, forget it. The Water Goblin, the Water Goblin has a main tune that will be stuck in your brain forever. It's just, ya dum bum da 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 dum bum 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 da 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 dum Drive you crazy. Absolutely, and you get to hear it about a billion times. Fantastic stuff. So here's the story of the Water Goblin. All right, uh, it's a lovely sunny day, and a girl goes out to do her laundry down by the lake. And her mother says, I wouldn't do that if I were you because the water goblin is swimming around looking for a wife and he will grab you. And she says, ah, come on, what's to worry? It's lovely. Everything's going to be fine. So she goes out onto the bridge over the lake to do her laundry. And guess what happens? Yes, you guessed it. The water goblin collapses the bridge to a grand stroke on the tam-tam, which is inaudible in most performances, unfortunately, and drags her down to the lake. Well, she's miserable. I mean, she's living underwater. She's wet. It's moldy. It's damp. She, her husband is kind of creepy. And of course, she is wishing that she could go home. But her, her misery is livened or lightened up somewhat by the fact that she's also pregnant by you-know-who, the water goblin, and she has a baby. And she likes the baby, and she likes the baby better than she likes the father, which isn't surprising, which makes him very annoyed. So he just jumps and stamps around and makes a lot of, you know, irritating, irritating noises and threatening gestures. And she says, you know, I probably could be nicer to you if you let me go home to see my mommy. It's been such a long time that I've been down here with you in this dank old cave. And so he says, OK, you can go see your mother, but you got to leave the baby behind for ransom. And if you're not back when the Vespers bell chimes, then, oh, there's going to be hell to pay. So she says, sure, no problem. And off she goes. And there's a lovely little dialogue on the cello and the flute, which is the mother and the daughter. And they 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 talk and reminisce for about you now 45 seconds or so and then and then a storm comes up over the lake it, things get dark there are soft beats on the tam-tam and ominous string tremolos it's actually a passage that Dvorak borrowed from a similar similar scenario in the specter's bride his cantata which will be the subject of another talk but in any case, the storm is brewing and the bell starts to ring. Bingity, 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 bing. But she does not return. The mother forbids her to go back to the water goblin. So the water goblin gets very, very irritated, which, you know, because she promised. And he comes up out of the lake and he starts pounding on the door to the bass drum and the bass is going thwump, thwump, thwump. And, and it gets more and more embroiled and crazy and hysterical. And finally, with a crash, he decapitates the baby and flings it on the doorstep. And that is the end of the story. The rest is a very solemn and depressing little coda. Really, really dark, really gloomy. And the ending is incredibly similar to the ending of Sibelius's On Saga, which only leads us to wonder. It's kind of fascinating because actually On Saga, I think, was written first. In fact, I'm sure it was written first. So uh, that, that's a coincidence. It's got to be a coincidence. The, the, the thematic material between the two tone poems is also rather similar. So that's the Water Goblin. Gruesome, but it's fabulously pictorial, wonderfully melodic, fabulously scored. At one point, if you use the full orchestration, it's got eight horns and two tubas, although no one plays it that way. But yes, it's, it's marvelous. All right. Next comes the Noonday Witch. Now, the Noonday Witch is another fantastic little story about village life. There's a little boy. He's out playing. He becomes obnoxious. His mother scolds him and says, you behave 
or the noonday witch is going to come get you. <clears throat> well, he doesn't behave. He does it again. The whole section repeats itself. And this all works fabulously musically. I mean, there's like nice, nice forms with beautiful built-in repetitions and developments. So he repeats it. And guess who shows up? Yes, the noonday witch. She shows up and demands that the mother hand over the naughty child. The mother, of course, refuses. And the noonday witch proceeds to chase them around the house. They go zipping around to a grotesque little scherzo. And finally, the mother clasps the child to her breast as the noon bell strikes. There's bells. There's always a bell. You know, there's a bell meaning something's going to happen in this music. So the bell strikes noon, the witch vanishes, poof, she's gone. And husband comes home for lunch because he's been at the office or at work or chopping wood or playing with his sheep or whatever he does. And he shows up for lunch and he sees his wife and the child unconscious on the floor. And he goes and revives his wife. And they, she explains what happened. And they look at the child and try and wake him up. But he's dead. And the end in this case is, is the mocking laughter of the noonday witch as she goes, you know, riding off on her broomstick, having exacted her revenge. Very, very tragic. And the interesting thing about this particular tone poem is that it has really quite a sense of humor until the tragic ending. The chase is rather amusing, you know, amusingly grotesque. And the scolding, the mother scolds the child too. Wait a minute, I've got a sample here. This is Charles McCarris with the Czech Philharmonic on Superfond. Ooh, yes. We will talk about that again in a moment. Here is the mother scolding the child. See if this doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> Get it? Fate's knocking at the door, right? I mean, Dvorak really had so much more of a sense of humor than, than we give him credit for. Again, one of those underrated qualities in his music. But the other thing that it teaches us, it tells us, which I think is absolutely fascinating, is that Dvorak was out to demonstrate the right of Czech music and Czech musicians to participate in wider European culture, to use these cultural objects in his own way. And he does it right there with the opening of Beethoven's Fifth. It's a marvelous, marvelous moment and a fascinating, a fascinating gloss on a composer who was a heck of a lot sharper and shrewder than he's often given credit for being. So that's the Noonday Witch. Next comes the Golden Spinning Wheel. Now, this is the most problematic of the four because it's the longest. It usually lasts between 25 and 27 minutes. Traditional performances, even in Czech lands, cut some bits of it which made it about five minutes shorter, which is a big mistake. You should never, ever, ever do that because the music that gets cut is critical, A, to the story, and B, to the symmetry of the work formally, and C, they're not literal repetitions. They're, they're changes in orchestration and detail each time, so there shouldn't be any problem listening to it. But here is the story. Dornichka is sort of a Cinderella type. She has an evil stepmother and an evil stepsister. Dornichka, I think that's her name. I don't know. It's something like Dornichka. Let's just call her Kim. It's so much easier. So Kim is out in the woods and she meets the handsome prince. And they, he's out hunting. And they immediately fall in love. And they agree to get married, but he's hunting. So he has to go home and de-hunt. And then he's going to come back and get her. 
and they're going to be very blissfully, wonderfully happy. Well, she comes back and tells mom and evil stepsister about her good fortune, and the predictable happens. They plot to kill her, and they do. They kill her. They chop her up, and they spread the parts around, and they save a few because, I mean, you never know what could happen, right? I mean, she could somehow be reassembled, and we don't want that to happen, right? So they keep they keep some some choice bits of her, which is disgusting, and 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 the evil stepsister sort of dresses up as her, and when the prince comes back, she passes herself off as him. I mean, they've only met once, after all. I mean, I guess it's plausible, and they go to the castle to celebrate their marriage. Now. Now, in the meantime, a holy hermit, you know, there's plenty of those hanging out in the woods, a holy hermit comes by and sees the body parts strewn across the forest floor and, using some magic holy water, reassembles them. But there's some missing bits. And and since he, he's a holy hermit, he knows what's happened, he basically goes to the, to the castle and agrees with the soon-to-be queen to swap a body part for a piece of a golden spinning wheel. There's like a golden spindle and a golden staff thing and a golden wheelie thing, you know, whatever. There are three parts. It's three of everything. It's a biblical number, right? So, so the stupid, stupid, evil, soon-to-be queen agrees because she's greedy and amongst her other fine qualities. And, and she, she swaps out the missing body parts for the golden spinning wheel. So the, the holy hermit is able to reconstitute Kim and put her back together and bring her back to life. And off they go to the castle where the wedding is being celebrated. You may recognize this story also as very similar to Mahler's Das Klagendelied, except from the feminist point of view because the, the murdered character is female instead of male, but it's the same thing. And, you know, the evil, you know, the prince is a good guy and Mahler, the queen, is a bad girl. And it, it, but it's the same story, basically, right? It's like dead body object tells story of murder plot. Because at the wedding, the spinning wheel of gold starts spinning and it sings. And guess what it says? It gives the whole story away. So evil stepsister and stepmother are suitably punished. And Kim and the prince get together and get married and live happily ever after. So this one has a happy ending. Even if it does have death and dismemberment in the middle of it, it's only temporary after all. So who cares? So that's the golden spinning wheel. And it's the three time, threefold swapping of body part episode that usually gets cut. Usually you only get one gazunta pile of body parts and the other two have to be left to your imagination. But you should have all three. I mean, if you're going to go for one, you might as well go for them all. And so that's the golden spinning wheel. Now, the last one is the wood dove. And the wood dove is really, in some ways, the most orchestrally lavish and gorgeous of them all. I know that Mahler knew this piece when he came to write his fifth and seventh symphonies. And you'll know exactly what I mean when you hear it. I have a sample of it. But let me tell you the story. First of all, the story is very straightforward. Woman has a lover. She decides to poison her husband. And she does. And because she poisons them, poisons him, she buries him under a tree outside her bedroom window. Not the best place to stash a body, but she does. Again, these people are not terribly bright. They're they're peasants, right? I mean, if they were bright, they would they would be much cleverer in how they kill people. But she gets married. And the, the wedding ceremony is just fabulous. It's the most beautiful music, some of the most beautiful music Dvorak ever wrote. It is gorgeous. However, outside of the bedroom on the limb of the tree is a little dove. And the little dove coos. And the cooing sound is this marvelous warbling for upper woodwinds and, and harp sort of tremolo things that Mahler really used in the first Nachtmusik of the Seventh Symphony. But in any case, so the wood dove is cooing constantly and it's driving her nuts and she gets crazier and crazier until finally overcome with guilt, she flings herself out of the window into the river below next to the tree and she's 
dead. And the funeral march, it begins with a funeral march. The funeral march for her dead husband becomes her own funeral march. But there is a sort of seraphic chorale-like postlude that suggests that the wood dove, at least, and the spirit of her dead husband is at last finding tranquility at the end of the story. It's, it's hauntingly beautiful music, diaphanous and beautifully, beautifully scored. Also, a bit like the end of the adagio of Mahler's Fourth Symphony, but the real Mahler bit is the funeral march at the beginning. I mean, it's incredible how much it sounds like the funeral march in Mahler's Fifth Symphony, you know, with the solo trumpet and the cymbal and bass drum Salvation Army percussion behind it. And, and an extra touch, another humorous touch of Dvorak is the widow weeping crocodile tears at the funeral march going, boo at the violins. It's really, really cool and so well done and so graphically descriptive of what's going on. Here it is. Here's that moment leading up to the first big climax of, of ominous despair and tragedy to come. Here you go. That's the wood dove. Now, it just so happens that these four tone poems, which last for, well, the shortest is the Noonday Witch. It's about 12 minutes. And the longest, as I said, is the Golden Spinning Wheel, which is about 25. The other two are like 20, 21, 22. So all four of them happen to fit just on a very well-filled 80-minute long CD or so. That's the other reason why I'm limiting this talk to performances uh, or recordings that contain all four of them in one set on one or two CDs. Because it's just, it's just so much easier to get them that way. There are other sets out there. So let's talk about recordings. For many, many years, really until Istvan Kertes did, started doing them uh, with his, in association with his Dvorak Symphony Cycle, you could only get Czech performance of these, of these works and they were hard to find in the West. And so people really didn't know them. We really didn't. And Kertes whose performances are excellent, by the way. They're marvelous, but I can't talk about them separately because he never got to the wood dove. Ah, doesn't that just suck? Because he did all the others, but he never got to the wood dove. So that's a problem. All of these other folks did it. Then there's there's the Naxos cycle, which Naxos did them all, but never put them together. So that rules out that bunch as a group. But some of the performances with Anthony Vitt, for example, are very, very good, those Naxos recordings. Another, another set, which is, well, we'll talk about those in a minute. Let's talk about the Czech sets, because those were the ones we had as we were growing up. And the first of them was this one with Zdzinek Chalabala. Now, Chalabala was a fabulous conductor. This was done in 1961 in stereo which is marvelous with the Czech Philharmonic in vintage form, but there's a problem. The problem is the version of the Golden Spinning Wheel has the cut. 
Oh, why? Oh, it's terrible. It's such a tragedy. And that means this cannot be your only version, nor should it be. They're very good. Halabala is very good. But there is sometimes a certain mystique around these historical performances that's undeserved. And I don't mean that these aren't as good as people say they are. They are. They're every bit as good as people say they are. But, but there have been performances subsequently that are just as good. They really are. And so you don't have to you know, be tearing your hair out if you can't find the classic Chalabala. And if somebody talks to you about the classic Chalabala, then just say to them, cuts, cuts in the golden spinning wheel. Sorry, no go. There you are. But if you can get it, you should hear it. It's marvelous. It's absolutely great. So we'll put that one down. There. Another one that you may have seen. Boy, this was old. I can't believe I still saved this one. This is Zdenek Kozler. This is on the Opus label, which I don't think exists anymore. Um, I doubt you'll find this anymore. It was with the Slovak Philharmonic, and it, it contains a hero's song and the symphonic variations. These performances are a little rough and ready, not exactly fabulously recorded, but they were authentic, idiomatic Czech performances. Kozler was a great conductor of this music. I actually find a couple of these a little bit sluggish. The Golden Spinning Wheel sort of hangs fire, which it can because of the, you know, threefold body part swapping sequence, which can be a little bit on the dull side. But I just wanted to let you know that they exist, not that you'll ever find them. But if you collect these pieces, you may be interested. Then in the digital era, we got this one, Bohemil Gregor with a Czech Philharmonic. This was on Denon Superfund. Maybe it's on regular Superfund now. I, th I think it's still on Denon. I do not like these performances. You get all five of the tone poems, including a hero song. Gregor was principally an opera, com an opera conductor. These performances, like most of what he did, are very stiff. He was a very rhythmically stiff conductor, and this music involves a lot of repetition of short melodies based on Czech speech rhythms. I mean, Janicek really loved these pieces because of their, their experimental use of the rhythms of Czech speech in creating the melodies, which make wonderful melodies, but when you have to hear them 500 times, you want a certain flexibility of pulse, the freedom of speech. Gregor is rhythmically straightjacketed, and so I don't recommend this set. It's not terrible, it's the Czech Philharmonic, but when you've heard the other ones, you realize right away that he's an interpreter. This guy had, had nothing going on upstairs. Nothing. Nothing. He was just beating time. However, you can also get with the Czech Philharmonic Václav Neumann. This is one disc, well recorded, good stereo recordings. And you know, Neumann's always underrated because he wasn't Ann Churl and because the Czech Philharmonic was starting to sound a little bit more kind of westernized and less distinctive under his leadership. But this is a first class set of the tone poems. They are really, really good performances. Um, they, are, they are quick, they are lively, they are characterful, and, and I think this is a beautiful disc. And I would actually listen to this in preference to Chalabala, believe it or not, I would. I just think that the performances are every bit as lively, every bit as well played, better sounding, and the golden spinning wheel is not cut. You get it all, so that's a good thing. Now, let's talk about as I was taught, saying, the Western versions, the more recent Western versions. There is a set of tone poems with Nimi Yarvi and the Scottish National Orchestra, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. They were issued originally in connection with his performances of the individual symphonies, with his Dvorak cycle, which is actually right behind me. And then the tone poems were issued separately on a couple of discs, and it's typical Yarvi. There are some great performances, the Wild Dove or the Wood Dove, it's fantastic and wonderfully recorded. But then some of them were kind of sloppy and blowsily recorded, like the Water Goblin. It was really a problem, so they're a mixed bag, and you can do better, and you know, fine as some of them are, and nicely recorded as some of them are, you can do better. So I'm not worrying about Yarvi. The Naxos, as I said, is in various places. One recent one that really shocked me, because it's really good, of the four basic tone poems was Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. Believe it or not, they are first-class performances. Really, really good. And I get a sense listening to it, you know, you know Rattle, Rattle was always trying too hard trying too hard to be profound, to do something meaningful in music that he didn't really understand. Music in sonata form, for example. I think that was always an issue with him. But here, where, where they can let their hair down, both him and the orchestra, I think they're just having a good time.
It's like their recording of Rachmaninoff's The Bells and the Symphonic Dances, when they're not stuck having to do something symphonic, which is self-evidently important, and show how significant and profound they can be, and they can just relax and make music. They can do great stuff, or they did do great stuff. And these Dvorak tone poems, with Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic on Warner, are first class. You can read my review over in classicstoday.com if you want to have more details. So I do want to mention that cycle because I have it. It's just not here in the overflow room. It's in it's over in Brooklyn along with Yarvies and you know the Naxos box and some of the other stuff. One of the reasons it took me a little time to get to this talk is because the performances were divvied up between the two places. I didn't have room to have like a dozen versions of these things in both spots. So that's why it's taken me so long to get to them. But now we're talking about sort of more modern performances or performances done outside of the Czech lands or with non-Czech personnel in some way. I mean, I had to divide them somehow. Forget it. We're doing the other four. Here we go. Kubelik. Kubelik is great, period. All you need to know. Kubelik is fabulous. I think his Water Goblin has the most sensible treatment of the very complicated symbol part. And they're just, they're just wonderfully alert rhythmic, exciting performances. The only catch, there's got to be a catch, is that in the Wood Dove, Kubelik does something very odd that he did in several other places in his work. He substitutes a snare drum for a tambourine in the wedding music. It's it's wrong, and I don't know why, but the problem is that is that tambourine is usually abbreviated tamb, and tam can also mean tamboro militaire or tambour militaire or, you know, something, something snare drum like. And so some conductors do that, but it's a tambourine part. And we know this because, you know, if you listen to every other performance ever done, it's a tambourine part. And because the way it's written, it's clearly not a snare drum part. It's just, it, I don't know why Kubelik did that. It's not criminal. It doesn't take anything terrible away from it. But you really ought to have a tambourine at a wedding. Not a snare drum, unless the people getting married are like Nazis. Anyway, so, it, but they're fabulous performances and well worth having. And I don't need to tell you that Kubelik is great. Kubelik is great. And that's that. Then, surprisingly fine and easy to get and fairly inexpensive, if you can still find them, was was Theodore Kuchar with the Janicek Philharmonic on, on Brilliant Classics. Now, this was a set, this is a three-disc set of all kinds of, like, spare Dvorak stuff. And it also includes, I think, the, the best modern recording of the symphonic variations. It's just exciting as hell and, and sharp as a sharp as a tack and amazing. But you get all the tone poems, and they're, as usual with this orchestra, you know, it was a second-class orchestra, but Kuchar is a first-class conductor. And he gets them to play, and the recording is good, not fabulous, but it's good and lively. And you get the Czech Suite and My Home and Hussite and In Nature's Realm and Othello and Carnival and What's Not to Love. It's a great cheap set. So you can get it with confidence, and you'll have very, very nice performances of these symphonic poems. I just think... I like this set. I like this set very, very much. It's really fantastic. So that's worth considering. However, there are two, two which are the modern references in the Dvorak symphonic poems. And those are, one you know, Macaris. Absolutely, Macaris with the Czech Philharmonic, the four tone poems. They're on one disc on Superfun or in this wonderful little, you know, slim box of, you know, Macaris doing all of the Dvorak and Smetna recordings that he made for Superfun, which is, I mean, self-recommending. And the other is Harnencourt. Harnencourt with the Concertgebouw. First of all, because he's got the Concertgebouw. And second of all, because Harnencourt, you know, he was a little eccentric and these tone poems are a little bit eccentric. He gets them. He really gets them. They're part, I think, of his his musical DNA this Viennese, Central European, Slavic, grotesque, folk-like. I mean, he just brings every drop of color out of them. He plays them to the nines. The orchestra is fabulous. The sonics are wonderful. There's absolutely nothing not to love. 
So this is Harnoncourt on Warner, if you can still find it. You know, he did, his Dvorak was all in a Dvorak box. It's just, these things were all coupled and spread out all over the place at one point in their lives. And where they are now is anybody's guess. But you should know that if you want to get great Dvorak tone poems, Macaris and Harnoncourt in modern sound with just the best playing and the best conducting, these are the ones. Harnoncourt and Macaris for Dvorak tone poems. So... Keep on listening. I tried. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me from the Overflow Room. Take care.